All right, guys, welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John and Rob. Yellow. Hello. This week, John is sharing a story. John, why don't you tell us about it? I selected um, Ray Bradbury's story. I've seen it listed as August 2026, There Will Come Soft Rains, and as just There Will Come Soft Rains. All right, and you're going to read a section. I'm going to read a section. 10 o'clock. The sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone in a city of rubble and ashes. This was the one house left standing. At night, the ruined city gave off a radioactive glow, which could be seen for miles. 10.15. The garden sprinklers whirled up in golden founts, filling the soft morning air with scatterings of brightness. The water pelted the window panes, running down the charred west side where the house had been burned evenly, free of its white paint. The entire west face of the house was black, save for five places. Here, the silhouette and paint of a man mowing a lawn. Here, as in a photograph, a woman bent to pick flowers. Hours. Still farther over, their image burned on wood in one titanic instant. A small boy, hands flung into the air, higher up, the image of a thrown ball, and opposite him a girl, hands raised to catch a ball which never came down. The five spots of paint, the man, the woman, the children, the ball, remained. The rest was a thin, charcoal layer. The gentle sprinkler rain filled the garden with falling light. Until this day, how well the house had kept its peace. How carefully it had inquired, who goes there? What's the password? And, getting no answer from lonely foxes and whining cats, it had shut up its windows and drawn shades in an old maidenly preoccupation with self-protection which bordered on a mechanical paranoia. It quivered at each sound, the house did. If a sparrow brushed a window, the shade snapped up. The bird startled flew off. No, not even a bird must touch the house. The house was an altar with 10,000 attendants, big, small, servicing attendants and choirs, but the gods had gone away, and the ritual of the religion continued senselessly, uselessly. Twelve noon. A dog whined, shivering, on the front porch. The front door recognized the dog voice and opened. The dog, once huge and fleshy, but now gone to bone and covered with sores, moved in and through the house, tracking mud. Behind it were angry mice, angry at having to pick up mud, angry at inconvenience. For not a leaf fragment blew under the door, but what the wall panels flipped open and the copper scrap rats flashed swiftly out. The offending dust, hair, or paper, seized in miniature steel jaws, was raced back to the burrows. There, down tubes which fed into the cellar, it was dropped into the sighing vent of an incinerator, which sat like evil ball in a dark corner. The dog ran upstairs, hysterically yelping to each door, at last realizing, as the house realized, that only silence was here. It sniffed the air and scratched the kitchen door. Behind the door, the stove was making pancakes, which filled the house with a rich baked odor and the scent of maple syrup. The dog frothed at the mouth, lying at the door, sniffing, its eyes turned to fire. It ran wildly in circles, biting at its tail, spun in a frenzy, and died. It lay in the parlor for an hour. Two o'clock, sang a voice, delicately sensing decay at last. The regiments of mice hummed out as softly as blown gray leaves in an electrical wind. Two fifteen, the dog was gone. In the cellar, the incinerator glowed suddenly, and a whirl of sparks leaped up the chimney. My version didn't have the bit about the gods. I wonder if the different titles are different. That could be. Okay. I don't know. Which line, Which part? Uh, the bit about like the gods had all gone away. Oh, the gods had all gone away and the ritual of the religion continued senselessly, uselessly. Yeah. yeah mine didn't have that either. I wonder if- Good line, too. Yeah, oh. I know. I feel like I missed a crucial part here. <laughs> well, and what else have I missed? We'll have to we'll explore that because if this is the if the online version is slightly different, I wonder if I think um I mean I'm reading it off of an anthology. Okay. How many pages is there in the anthology? It's it's totally different pagination. It's like five. One, two, this one's five, three, two. Four. It's five, yeah. That's so I'm pissed about that line. Uh, I know that um, I think this story came out somewhere and then it appeared in a, uh, a collection or a work called The Martian Chronicles. Mm, I think cool. he revised some of those stories to kind of fit into a supernatural like a narrative of some okay. kind, tie them together in some way. I don't know how. I didn't read that that collection, but all right. Well, but I was worried about that when I sent you guys that, that link. link that it'd be different. Well, it doesn't take away from the meaning, just sort of. Yeah, yeah. there's little moments, and it's Bradbury. So those he's I such an amazing stylist with some of these lines that it's uh, it's sad to miss him. Yeah, that's a great line. Well, had you read this before you picked it, or what oh, made yeah. you choose it? Okay, I read it years ago. The, the reason I picked it is because I'd spent so much time on this podcast talking about point of view and characters that I thought it'd be interesting to look at a story with no characters. Well, at least on the surface, no characters, mm. right? So I was like, oh, I remember that story. I assigned it in a class that didn't it didn't go very well, but uh, this one didn't. The class overall, I, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but um, <laughs> but I had all these different stories that like played with POV in different ways. Okay, I don't think students were into it, but um, I obviously you can tell from this podcast I'm into it. Mm-hmm. But I thought that would be this story. Just remembering it from that, I was like, oh, that would be an interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition with other things we talked about, like stream of consciousness and different ways we've talked about POV. I thought maybe so. That's why I picked it. It's one of those ones I don't know how anyone could ever copy even what he's done here, which is there's no characters. <laughs> I would never like assign that to someone, right? Write a story with no characters. Yeah. I mean, what he's describing is some kind of post-apocalyptic scenario where this automated house in the year 2026 is still going, going, going until the bitter end and it goes up in flames. It's the last house standing, though, until then. And we don't know what happened to the family or how or why, but there's enough about how this house kind of, it's so insistent on surviving. It's just its just doing everything that it becomes a character. Yeah, it's sad the, that the way, too, because you, the house is obviously not aware that the humans are gone. So this whole time it's it's cooking food that it cleans up and it's feeding the dog, but then wiping the dog away. It's it's telling the family at the very beginning to like get ready and go to work. And then we find out that there's no family leaving or following these prompts. There's something so sad about it because the house is unaware of the the ruin it's surrounded by. So you feel, I, I felt myself feeling for this stupid house and these robot mice. And then near the end it's like at 10 o'clock the house began to die yeah so by then he has established it as a character it and it, it did feel like a death because at the very end there's like the one lone wall that survives and it keeps chirping out the date and time on a loop so it's broadcasting it's it's like the black box yeah. of what happened yeah i don't think you'd see a story quite like this today it seems like such a cold war artifact which is mm. which is really neat it's cool how he has all these kind of words initially that we tend to have beautiful associations with. It's August, it's California, it's oh, morning, yeah. it's bright, there's eggs, there's toast, there's milk, and it's just gorgeous. But then I, I think I intuited what was going on maybe in the second, I think I knew immediately. I think that maybe the first sentence, as if we were afraid that nobody would. I mean, and then the morning house lay empty and the clock ticked on. And I know I've read maybe one or two uh, Bradbury stories, but I'm not at all familiar outside of that. But it's great when someone can immediately posit that this is a house everyone's gone and it's not for a good reason either so that's a good trick for writers to try to pull off is how quickly can you get someone involved and how quickly can you reveal it and then keep building and building and building this this one also building off of that it's it's trying to also quickly build a world i think and a time and a place but i think one of the easiest ways to do that back in these days was to pretend that everything was going to be automated right like if you're reading this in the 50s you knew this was the future oh yeah and when yeah. we read this now we know in in a sense that this would have been the future, but all of these things that are automated, they haven't come to fruition. It's 2019, right? And Alexa I don't have does anything. It all. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I still have to assemble my breakfast sandwiches. Like mm-hmm. that's right. So it it hasn't come to pass, but we can still read it and appreciate it for what years. it was. Yeah, for what it was trying to do. But I think that's another kind of way that this was done quickly. I like like those first lines. It starts to personify the, the house pretty quickly. Yeah. So like as it um as if it were afraid. As if it were afraid that nobody would um oh get up. That's what it is. Time to get up. It's it's yelling as if it were afraid that nobody would like suggesting the house has a fear mm-hmm. that no one's listening to it is a personification, a very obvious personification. But uh, that's how the story is setting up that house as the character. And the fact that the family is burned into the house, too, is really, that's so, that's so hugely thematic, too, isn't it? Like, yeah. you guys have been literally burned into this machine that you made. I like, too, how this was, so I described it as, like, post-apocalyptic, but this very much feels like a sudden death for the entire city because they were living the perfect American dream up until the literal point that they died, right? The kids were tossing a ball and the wife was plucking a flower. They weren't hiding in their bunker. No. They hadn't outlasted everyone else. They were the people making dinner at Mount Vesuvius. It's the same thing. Yeah. You guys read or, read or heard about what happened in Hiroshima when the bomb went off? Mm-mm. It's, I mean, it's horrific. Yeah, I've heard some awful shit. <laughs> like, but the yeah. thing about the shadows, there's there are literal shadows yeah, left right. on Yeah, right. Okay, sure. Things. I read a story when I was very young that was about Hiroshima. It was a book. Uh, it was called True Tales of Terror. And I can't find it. I have no idea what happened in this book. But uh, the story about Hiroshima stuck with me so strongly. Right. And I'm old enough that part of my childhood was actually spent before the end of the Cold War. <gasps> so I, I, 
I used to have uh, actual have dreams about nukes going off in, oh in cities and stuff. So this is very uh, speaks to that that time, obviously. So a lot of this is, I think, very reminiscent of that kind of hellscape and fire and all that destroyed Hiroshima after. Like, literally, this is what happened in that city after the bomb went off. And the ticking clock, I know the ticking clock was a big deal in the Cold War, too, as far as how cl- I think they used the clocks it's similar to how we use the color-coded terror, or how somebody uses the color-coded <laughs> terror thing. Yeah. And throughout the story, it's 5 o'clock, it's 9 o'clock, it's 9-5, so you're always kind of conscious of time. And I think not only because it's the house's last day on Earth, but I think he's just kind of doubling up and playing on that the uh i'm not sure what it was called the nuclear clock whatever it was called as for not having characters obviously we talked about the the house being a character the dog gets to be a character briefly because it comes on stage and it does stuff and um the fire is personified in pretty uh vibrant ways right yeah the spark that were stuck out to me yeah you know the fire crackled up the stairs it fed upon you know something feeding it feels de- like a deliberate eating right. picasso's and matisse's in the upper hall like delicacies the fire backed off a couple paragraphs later. But the fire was clever. It had sent flames outside the house, up through the attic to the pumps there. And um, when uh, uh, something happens, the fire rushed back into every closet and fell to the clothes, felt of the clothes hanging there, which is an interesting way mm-hmm. to describe the fire pawing at clothes in some way. So when I said, you know, this is a story without characters, it, on the surface, it has no characters, it has no people in it, but everything that appears on stage has agency or is given right. agency, lent agency. So it's exciting to read that way at least yes yeah. but uh, i mean so obviously like we said there's no people moving and talking in this story but we do learn a lot about how they lived that make us feel for them in some way and particularly my favorite part about that was how the house each night would read poetry to the wife yeah, yeah that was fun so he says what what poem do you want and she doesn't say anything because she's not there and so he picks one and it's a real poem yeah and did it, you look this up yeah i had yeah. to because i was like did ray bradbury just also write a perfect poem <laughs> yeah or is this, did this exist on its own? And like, I wonder how and when he decided to incorporate that. You know, I always think about when you read something that perfect, it's like, did he search around? He couldn't Google. So he must have known about this poem and how perfectly it fit. But it's talking about how when humans leave the earth in something, some catastrophic way, no part of Mother Nature will care because they'll be better off for it, basically. I love that part. So you felt like you were hearing about well off, a well off nuclear family, nuclear, and they had, you know, the boy and the girl and the picket fence, I assume, and the breakfast in the morning and they went to their jobs and she read poetry at night and they sounded like they had the dog and they entertained guests. So in some ways they're very flat, but the part about the poem, I was like, in the future, even in the future, they want to read poetry. I don't know. I really like that part. The kind of overt personification, it seems like the narrator as it is, you see seems so unwilling to give up the fact that there's anything left to personify that people still deserve a voice <laughs> which is fun but it also kind of makes me wonder like well could the writer I'd like to I'd like to, I like this story I'd like to see the writer take the same shot at it without the personification like all right but I, I I really like the fact that the idea that he's like he's unwilling to give up humanity's place here by not personifying but if he did what does that take away from the story and it take obviously it would lend a, a huge coldness to it right because the, yeah, yeah. the action isn't about us anymore or it's not about us like but it would still but i think it would have i'm not sure if it had more of an oomph i would just like to see two versions of the story i I really want to see where it's just show me what it looks like afterwards which is it's a different story but i think it would be kind of just a fun companion thing too that would be interesting i mean language is so filled with hidden agency like in its verbs and stuff we use the verbs in kind of a thoughtless way like we will say a thing like the comet took aim at jupiter right but taking aim implies a conscious decision where if the what's we have to like limit ourselves to very basic kind of unassuming verbs like the comet flew <laughs> towards yeah. Jupiter. Which has such a hopelessness about it, which I don't think sits well with us on like a very deep level. Yeah. It almost seems godless or I think that, yeah, when there's just nothing there. I think it kind of speaks to boredom too. I'm, this isn't, this is probably a little bit of a tangent, but if when you're really bored, there's nothing happening and there's nothing being acted upon. And I think not having personification would really expose something that's using person- personification Personification as sort of like a buffer or to kind of soften the blow a little bit, if that makes any sense. It does, yeah. 
Like some of it, like you guys said, there's so much to language that is doing the work of personification, whether or not you intend it to, right? If because you it's choose, our tool in any way. It's our thing. We made it up. So it's everything is doing something like a human would. But I imagine he did pick certain things to reinforce all of that. I don't know. I just felt like there are definitely sections that he beefed up, but there are probably sections that he couldn't help. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Bradbury is such a, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, he has, has such an interesting interesting style. Actually, before I reread this, I, you know, like I said, I remembered it and I said, oh, I'm going to suggest that. And then I reread it and I was like, oh, yep, yeah, there it is. There's Bradbury's style. Because, you know, you read Fahrenheit 451 or you read anything else he writes. He has such a, florid might be the wrong word, but he has such a keen linguistic sense of just for descriptions. And I think stuff. florid's exactly the word. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. yeah. You don't see a lot of like feminine florid, not to sound sexist, but it, right. it sounds like there's just a, a pretty quality to it. So I, I think Bradbury, when he he, when he sits down to write, I mean, this is just his natural style is to, to go all in. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's going to do that. He's going to he's gonna puff it up. Well, that was going to be my takeaway. Uh, I was writing a longer short story once that I never finished, and I'll finish it one day because I, w- I liked it. But I had an idea for a scene where I was going to spend a long time explaining the way a hurricane tore through a town. And I'm reminded of it here because oh, of good. how long we spend reading about the fire, but how none of those sentences feel old by, by the time that you're finished. We're reading about the ways that the fire is burning things up over and over and over and every sentence is new and fresh. And the way I think you usually see people doing that successfully is through personification because there's only so many verbs that we have for fire and the way that they burn. So otherwise you have to say like what it destroys, how it destroys it, how it crawls or moves. And Yeah, I think, yeah, that's that, uh, that goes back to just the idea of like the um, metaphors. We think of fire as being alive in so many different ways because it moves on its own and it feeds, it seems to feed right. does these these things that are very um reminiscent of a living creature um what you said made me think of uh my novel with the all the battles and stuff that mm-hmm. happened and early versions of that story i had like described in really um tactical detail all the movements of soldiers oh, sure. and stuff and i remember rereading them and being like this is so boring like who's gonna be interested in this and, and especially you know my wife would read and be like yeah i skim over the battle stuff and i was like yeah <laughs> I, I can't write it that way it's not interesting interesting i'm not writing like the um biography of hannibal or something where his tactics matter it's a story so i was like i made a deliberate decision that i'm gonna describe the battles as rising tides and rushing yeah. water and like right. the flow of power of uh, of advantage in a battle is like r- water the way water would flow through something and so every battle i kind of have to find new ways to describe you right know, surging uh rapids and stuff <laughs> yeah but, uh, <laughs> well and absent of a long extended scene where that's the point and you you realize that it's boring unless you pump it up this way. I think it's good practice anytime you're describing something inanimate like this or something commonplace even. If you want to punch it up, like don't write it the first or second way that you think up to write it. Spend a, a little more time thinking about how something could commit to that action and, and play it out. Your, your first sentence is probably not your best and it could probably be improved upon. So maybe you have to spend a whole page describing fire to like land on one you like or maybe you end up doing something really cool where you keep it all that's my takeaway what are your takeaways? I liked how he used time. How he like time stamps it all. Yeah, it's a good way to maintain te- um, tension really quickly, and it can, it can it can be kind of a um, kind of a uh, you can use it as like a gimmicky gadget too. Where it's like it's two thirty, and there's just right. kind of a, a gravity to that, and you can kind of play with that in fun ways. Even though he's using it for a point, like it's again right. ticking down to the end of the house. It's- I think it sometimes helps though. Sometimes um, in workshops, especially, I- I'll ask the person that wrote it, how long was this? How much time did this story cover? And if you can't tell, there's probably something that could be clarified. And here, it's the exact opposite. We know down to the minute what's happening. But that tells us that we're looking at this like intensified 20 minute thing, or maybe it's all day, but we know that every minute counts and we can probably anticipate it's all going to stay within that day. It really does help. Yeah, with an automated house, you would think it functions very precisely. So Yeah, yeah. so yeah. Good point, good point. My takeaway is um, writing without character, but my takeaway is that even when you don't write without character, that the language is kind of going to force you into into taking a perspective on things and kind of a point of view, and to not let that lead you astray. Don't ignore it, but pay attention to what the point of view is doing, because at 10 o'clock, the house began to die. 
die is suggestive of the house being this protagonist in, in, a, yeah. in a way. And then uh, and there, another part that says, until this day, how well the house had kept its peace, how carefully it had inquired, who goes there? What's the password? It's giving the house this deliberation, making the house a conscious creature after a, after a fashion. So when you choose your words, or your descriptions for describing something that has no character or no personhood to it, just to pay attention to the way in which that's brought about so that you can, number one, you can ask yourself if you wanted do that number two if you want to do that put like punch it up and and run with it awesome very good thanks guys